Welcome everybody to the first episode of Offspring Podcast. In this series of podcast episodes, we plan to explore new dimensions which we've not covered before in the directions of the life of a PhD student, alternative careers, the Open Science and Open Access Awareness Initiative, and many such topics. So stay tuned with us as we take you through the series of interviews and various interesting discussions with interesting people and join us for the ride. I'm your host, Srinath, and I'm going to be conducting most of the interviews along with my co-host, Nico, and we'll see you on the other side of this. episode we actually have two guests with us with Mohamed El Bolosi and uh, Julia Boitio from the Max Planck Institute of Art and Lung Research. Welcome guys. Thank Welcome you. to this. Thank you, yeah. So how's it going? It's going well and these uh, crazy days. Uh, yeah. I try to uh, stay healthy and sane with the stay sane being uh, more tough than staying healthy. But <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And we are some of the ones who are still in love, at least partially, and it's yeah. not ca- the case for everyone. So That's true. I mean, at least the institute is not shut down yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, the idea of this podcast would be to explore the boundaries of the life of a researcher. And since we've all sort of enrolled ourselves into this research life by starting to do a PhD, we try to get into the depths of what the PhD entails for each one of us. Let's start with Julia. So tell me about your PhD and the kind of work that you're doing right now. So now I'm like a fourth year PhD student. It's hard to realize that it's <laughs> the last year for us. And uh, for the past three years and a half, I've been working on zebrafish development, in particular the development of the heart and the cardiovascular system. And I've been following different uh, topics, different projects, but they are all more or less uh, in the same uh, big field of the, uh, I can call it intercellular communication. So how different cell types and how different cells communicate with each other in order to build a particular organ or to maintain the homeostasis of particular tissue, let's say. So I focus a lot on imaging and uh, image analysis and genetics uh, and these kind of tools. Okay, that's great to know. And what about you, Mohamed? Um, I'm also uh, at the end of my PhD. I'm actually uh, going to be done with my fourth year Fourth year in a week. So in it's a already, week? Yeah, wow. about, <laughs> so it's already a sign of uh, I have to move on. But yeah, as I, I was supposed to move on uh, sometime in fall, but uh, I'm not sure this will happen in time now. I um, I study um, how organisms and cells adapt to mutations in a way that would prevent them from de- developing defects or disease. Uh, and uh, my PG was trying to understand um, a specific mechanism through which uh, organisms and cells respond to mutations, which uh, can be deleterious or can have uh, um, huge effects or bad effects on the development of an organism or the biological functions or vital biological functions of cells uh, by increasing the production or the expression, we call it, of uh, compensating genes or genes that can take over the function of the gene that had the mutation. And um, yeah, so mainly my PG was trying to understand how does this happen? Uh, how does the cell get to recognize that it has a mutation and it has to increase the expression of other compensating genes? And um, yeah, and uh, uh, luckily I, ha- I already published my uh, my study, so uh, I'm right now in the phase of uh, uh, writing up my thesis and hopefully moving on in the future. That's uh, great to hear. Both of you are almost towards the end of your PhD cycles, but so. uh, let's take uh, you know sort of trip down memory lane and go back to the early beginning. So, what sort of prompted you to start doing a PhD? So, what made you sort of choose this? path to do research. So I start? 
then next question I leave is for Mohamed <laughs> first. <laughs> so uh, I think I have to go back a while. So uh, I with like with, with the dream I had for almost my entire life, I wanted to be a marine biologist since I was six years old for not very scientific reasons, mainly because I love animals and sea animals. Fish are cute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I kept this dream until the university, so I enrolled in biology for this, mainly. And then during the bachelor, actually, when I enrolled in the master in marine biology, after enrolling, I changed my mind. I decided that uh, I actually wanted to move more towards molecular biology. But overall, even if the topic changed, the main aim didn't, because even when I wanted to be a marine biologist, I always wanted to do a PhD. I think back then I really didn't know why. Now, after doing part of my PhD, I can say that I'm a person that gets bored very easily. So I wouldn't be suited for a career in a job that requires me to do similar things day by day. Yes. Although now, for example, I just finished uh, three days of image analysis that were not very different from each other, but that's luckily not the case in every day of my PhD. So I think my main uh, aim and my main drive was to learn something new every day. I love school. I love learning, although I didn't love studying as much, but learning is always great. And so the PhD and research in, in general it's a continuum, continuum learning uh, curve. So you never it's a continuous stop. learning curve yeah. keeps and changing you, day by day. You keep learning new things every day. And uh, you keep uh, doing new experiments and learning new techniques. And I think, and also understanding like what's behind the mechanism of life in general, what's, what was more exciting. And then the first thing that really I remember that uh, made me sure about starting a PhD was at the beginning of my bachelor thesis, the first time that I saw a zebrafish heart beating under a microscope. I remember that day still. And um, I fell in love with zebrafish and uh, the love continued. Though uh, now it's more a broad love for science and research. But that, I think, helped me to, to push me towards this. Mohamed, what about you? <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, it also goes back to my childhood days, like Julia. Um, I uh, I was always very curious and always asking a lot of questions, and uh, thereby, since I like since I was a kid, I I I like this uh, idea of um, trying to explore the unknown, and I think uh, being a scientist uh, or through doing a PhD is uh, something that um, helped me or like was for me uh, the obvious way to um, proceed into how I want to um, um, live uh, sort of um, so um, yeah so since I, I uh, since I was a kid I really wanted to pursue something which allows me to explore new stuff but also I was raised in a family that uh, had a, a medical background and uh, I always had this uh, will to uh, help humanity somehow. I mean, although we're not really always doing translational research, uh, but uh, that was the long term. And I was, I'm actually also trained as a pharmacist. Um, so uh, I, I always wanted to do something that can influence uh, people's life or help uh, people at some point uh, of uh, their lives. Um, so, so yeah, so it's mainly curiosity uh, that uh, like this continuous curiosity that I have and um, uh, which made me take this career. Uh, the other thing was, um, um, I, I come from Egypt, uh, which is um, um, uh, maybe not scientifically developed as uh, like first world countries. And uh, I have always been interested in how countries develop that much. And it was always obvious for me that it was science. And uh, so one of the goals which also made me want to become a, a scientist is that I want to know more. I want to become a scientist and hopefully one day uh, take this back or bring this back to my country and, and help them like, or like increase this desire to do science or increase the curiosity to do science. Because for me, this is the only way a nation uh, can develop. So, um, so yeah, these are the two main reasons why I pursue the PhD. The very profound reasons, uh, I would say. And I <laughs> think this is not just a problem of Egypt. 
I come from a first world country, Italy. In quotes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, still, the problem of at least now, probably back then, uh, the idea of the that the population had for science was different. I think now we are uh, especially in like a time frame where people don't really believe in science as much. And given the way the world's going, and think, all the conspiracy conspiracy theories and so on, uh, it is really which is yeah. really yeah. yeah I think but in Germany, of, we are lucky, I think. Exactly. Yeah, well, I also think that one positive uh, thing from the current crisis that we have is um, people are starting to appreciate science more, appreciate scientists more, and I think I think this will have um, big effects in the world uh, on how they view appreciate scientists and science. Like you mean the crisis now? Yeah, the, the uh, COVID nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we hope so. We hope so. I mean, also, but you can so just going off on a tangent for a quick while, so you can already see that there is a clear demarcation between science and pseudoscience and pseudoscience has somehow, somehow like a bigger voice so it gets picked up in news outlets more often and you sort of hear a lot of these fake stories but when real science comes it doesn't sort of get the you know the enough traction because m- not all discoveries are huge or profound many of them are minuscule but they sort of add up one on top of each other to exactly. build the overall sure. picture but also i think that one of the problems for that and connecting also to like uh, things like what we are doing with the phnet and so on is that pseudoscience uh, is usually made by very good communicators unfortunately people who know very well how to attract people and how to speak while sometimes scientists are not as good as communicating their science. Exactly. Yeah. And this is a big problem. You can be a great science, but scientist, but if you don't know how to share it in a way that it's attractive, it's a problem. People will hear more to something they think they understand, and that's pseudoscience, and not to real science. So we are also here for that, I, I think. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so important point raised there, so which demands the requirement of spreading science through accurate information and using proper communication tools to spread science around. So it's so that's one of the reasons why this podcast is has been started by the PhD Net. And uh, okay, so let's move on to let's get back into the circle that we were talking about about life in during research and doing PhD. So because we all work in like a laboratory environment, are there some specific challenging aspects to doing this sort of work, like working in a lab environment on a daily basis? What are the the challenges that you face uh, constantly? Um, I think for me, one of the biggest challenges was uh, dealing with um, frustration, (laughs) I would call it. So uh, science is not like a... um, a highway uh, with uh, which is clear and you just get to have a fast ride uh, but you, you appear like a lot of obstacles appear which you don't expect and uh, these can cause a lot of frustrations but actually some of these frustrations uh, are what can lead to a very big discovery uh, as we know from a lot of scientific history of scientific discoveries uh, so for me was like knowing when I have, for example, a failed experiment or when I have an experiment which gives me uh, negative results or results which I wasn't expecting, um, that instead like dealing with this frustration and knowing how to adapt to it in terms of uh, um, troubleshooting and in terms of um, trying to think in a different way that I initially thought of and, and thereby uh, develop the project in the direction where the results take me. So I think this was the main issue. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, pressure, uh, which uh, um, does not need to be there, but some um, like uh, in some situations it can build build up if you don't really know how to uh, re- get relieved from it. Uh, either it's from peer pressure, or from colleagues who are um, um, publishing faster, or is it, or from your or from your um, mentor or whatever, but. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I was lucky to publish quite fast, but on, 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 on the other hand, I know I'm, I'm just talking in general about uh, colleagues of mine whom I also like, or who had different kinds of pressures. Um, but uh, f- for me, like, was knowing when as well when I have this pressure, how to get relief. So I 
Um, I tried not to have my life based on the lab. Um, um, so uh, a lot of people, I mean, and this is a, a big mistake in, in, in while doing PhD. So a lot of people, like when they start a PhD, they only have their PhDs in mind and they would stay a lot in the lab. It doesn't mean that I do not stay a lot in the lab, but I do not like stay crazy amounts. And I also like have other things in, uh, to do in my life. I still do sports. Yeah, uh, but we'll uh, get to that when we're. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, but I engage of course, in, that, yeah, in, exactly. these are important activities that you have to engage in to keep yourself sane. Right? Exactly, and and also uh, like being part of active working groups like PhD Net or whatever. All of these things that can get you out of the PG, and of course, like uh, having. Uh, good friends around you who uh, whom you can always talk to and I think I was quite lucky to work in a lab where I made a lot of amazing friends one of which is Julia and you Srinath who are interview like who are in this podcast yeah yeah so I think Mohammed stole a lot of my words <laughs> so what am I about to say now so I think that yeah frustration is was the main deal the big deal of the PhD and just so I really think that whatever Mohammed said like really applies to me too but just to give another spin to it also the problem with frustration and failure and is that it might affect your self-esteem a lot and this happened to me at the beginning so much because I was lucky enough to have like a very good <laughs> records in school and in university so I always was led to, to to think that if you study, if you like really put the, your maximum effort in something, you're gonna succeed because this is um, how it happened to me until I started the PhD. Starting the PhD, but actually already some time during the master, I started to understand that sometimes effort is not enough yeah. to succeed. So even if I put my 100%, that's not gonna lead neg like necessarily to positive results. And at the beginning, this really affected my mood and my self-esteem. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say that for the first six months, I thought of leaving. Mm -hmm. And then you adapt and uh, you start understanding that things, not all the things depend on you. Yeah. Of course, some do. I'm not saying the, that. Yeah, uh, exactly, <laughs> of yeah. course, we do fail and we do make mistakes, but you learn how to accept that you do mistakes and then uh, at some point you find a balance between things that fail and things that succeed. And although, um, unfortunately, probably the amount of experiments that really give you a very cool and positive result uh, is fewer, but still the, the joy and the satisfaction is so much bigger than all the frustration. Uh, at the end, you find your balance. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, also, I think there's a huge shift in terms of the way we perceive science itself, right? Because when we're, at least in university, we're sort of reading what was someone else's research, but we accept these as facts. And so we're reading, reading just the positive results exactly. of them. Exactly, yeah. So we're reading the, these results, we're sort of understanding science, but then when you start doing research, you're discovering something which is completely new. Nobody has seen this before. Nobody has dreamt of this before. Nobody knew this is the way it's happening. So I kind of that that shift. So making that shift would definitely I I kind of feel creates a lot of uh, impact on people or the way we think or the way you understand you read and understand or the way you potentially try to put a story together. All of these would sort of play a role, uh, you know, sort of like a piece of pieces of puzzles falling together to build an overall picture. Yeah. Sure. And on top of that, uh, as Mohammed said, like there is pressure and there is for everyone and you have to find your way, your very personal way to deal with it. I think everyone has its own. But yeah, I I think what Mohammed said was basically yeah. the case, having something else in your life Definitely. to be able to consider because we all love and are passionate about this job. I think we couldn't do this job without passion, it's a job that demands passion. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to realize that it's a job. Yeah. And uh, it's not, it doesn't have to be 100% of your life. And if I actually may add something, which uh, is sometimes not very obvious, but I think luck is also a factor in, of in, course. in PhD. Of course. Yeah. So, I mean, of course you can, I mean, the smartest minds are, like you can spend a lot of time designing the perfect experiment and so on 
but it doesn't really work. So, although, I mean, I don't say that all of the successful scientists are just lucky. Of course not. I mean, most of them are smart, but at some cases you would need luck. So, uh, if you do your best and, um, and, and like do your research and come up with results that can or cannot be like groundbreaking, I think this, this puts sometimes a lot of pressure on someone while it's not really necessary because I think pl luck plays a factor. And if, if one accepts this, uh, I think it will make the pressure much less that as long as you do your best and take the time to design a perfect experiment or whatever, um, then um, um, one should be satisfied and not like put extra pressure on themselves. Yeah, definitely. But unfortunately, working in a lab with other people around you, of course, as you said, creates also peer pressure. So if you are not being so lucky, you might feel very bad if some people around you are lucky. So as everybody told me from the beginning, of course, you shouldn't look at other people mm -hmm. because yeah. each, each career one is different. and each, each project is different. Yeah. Although if we have to be 100% honest, it's very difficult not to look around you and just focus on yourself and your project like nothing is happening. Yeah, you can live in the bubble, but... Yeah, we. I, I wish I, I could not compare myself with other people, but, yeah. well, I do, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is how did doing a PhD change your daily life in terms of managing your time? or? What sort of time management skills did you pick up when you started doing the PhD? Yeah, I think this is one of the best skills uh, I've obtained or anyone can obtain from their PhD, which is time management. Um, especially at the beginning of your PhD when you're not really focused on one specific project or one specific question and you're exploring multiple questions or multiple uh, ideas. Um, so uh, um, for me, uh, at the beginning, uh, it, it required very strict time management um, because uh, it, essentially um, I, I really wanted to um, um, like investigate multiple hypotheses and uh, and uh, and th and then like take like spend let's say my first six months or one year of PG experimenting these different hypotheses and then choosing one later to continue working on so this was uh, required a lot of time management. And uh, of course, it uh, it was a lot of effort, especially if you want to keep up with other activities that you want to do in, your, in life, or for example, you, are, you have a family or a partner uh, or something like this. Um, um, but uh, for me, uh, so of course, I had a stricter time management schedule. And later on in my PhD as well, I, I started developing like um, a, a weekly uh, schedule, which was very strict and not very enjoyable, I have to say. But like where you not only plan experiments per day, but you also plan, or I did, uh, where like try to plan, for example, when will I do sports? When will I do blah, 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 blah? When will I, and all of these things. And um, it's not very uh, easy and required a lot of discipline. Um, but uh, um, yeah, this is, this is how a PhD changed uh, my life. Uh, but to be fair, it also made it more efficient. So once you have a good time management or once you have a good schedule, I think, uh, allows you to be more productive but also it's not really specific right sort of it's very flexible it of changes. course no it's not like you have to do this between seven exactly. and eight it's yeah like, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, i'm just saying it changes throughout of the course. site because in the beginning you might have sort of when you had to establish certain things you probably spent more time in the lab right yeah and later on you sort of when you knew certain things would take a certain amount of times you yeah that's why that's why i said like i try to adapt the schedule every week so yeah. um because it depends on the kind of experiments you want to do the kind of other life activities you have in this week, uh, and so on. Yeah, mm, that's very true, especially like PhD requires a lot of time management. I was today with another colleague, I was talking about the university times when I was used to finish around like 2 p.m. the classes and then go home and accept in the exam session. I was very free and I have to say I probably wasted a lot of my afternoons. I, I don't regret it, so I'm very happy and sometimes I miss it so much. But yeah, as Mohamed said, now we learn to be more efficient. And I think also, as we said before, keeping something else in your life helps you to like 
um, really become efficient and plan things because if you really want to do something else in the weekend, uh, you are forced to plan tightly your week in order to have the weekend free. So you cannot just do every day what happens and what uh, like comes up, but you have to plan, especially for me working in vivo, uh, having to deal with developmental stages of the fish, crossing and so on, that requires a lot of planning because you have to plan and sometimes not just a week, but like two weeks or a month in advance to see what you want to do in the next four weeks, at least roughly in order to to plan. So this is probably what really changed in my in yeah, my daily schedule. So of course compared to university I spend much more time working than uh, enjoying and yeah, uh, sure. reading or watching TV. One of the things I actually miss is I have less time for reading. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm planning not to papers, not yet no, exactly. No, no, no. I'm for <laughs> reading novels. Reading for leisure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah, I think this is the biggest change. And then uh, I think in all of our cases, what changes also we are not with our families anymore. Mm-hmm. So this change a lot in our uh, daily schedule. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> because we live alone and so on. So yeah, this change. I mean, there's definitely a lot of skills you developed in terms of. Uh, keeping your for example keeping certain parts of your day for yourself and certain parts of your day for doing other uh, you know non-lab related stuff and doing you know some lab related stuff and basically it's sort of it's again like this sort of you sort of let's say like because time is sort of limited per day right so because you have to sort of use it in a very judicious way no, in order to get it. Yeah. And I think you learn it during the PhD because at the beginning, uh, I think in my first year, I used to be here almost every weekend, I would say, mm-hmm. like like it was normal week. And then at some point I couldn't bear it anymore <laughs> because yeah. I needed a break. And deciding, okay, I'm not saying that now I never work on weekends, but I definitely reduced it. Mm-hmm. Of course, the, the time of the PhD also allows for that because I have less experiments on the bench exactly but on the other hand i also decided like it was a real decision not like to work less in the weekends and so this helped to to plan and i'm not less efficient than in my first year i'm actually more i'm more productive now than in my first year but i work like less uh, less hours per week i think i mean i once heard uh jan dietrich corner tell yeah, he's the head of the uh, European Space Agency. And so he was telling in an interview that I usually use all 24 hours of the day. And if I need more time, I use the night. <laughs> 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 so yeah. I suppose uh, that sort of logic is something that we <laughs> can't argue with. Yeah. <laughs> so... Moving on to a little more positive uh, topics because we're sort of sort of bringing. I think we're bringing the the listeners down by you know talking about things which are depressing <laughs> and a bit more. So what we say is one of the highlights of your PhD currently. So what do you think is like the best part of your PhD till date? What made you feel like you were the on top of the world? Are there events like that? Yeah, sure. Mine is uh, 2nd of October, 2018. It was a Monday. (laughs) I remember it, I don't know why, but I think it was the best day of the whole PhD. So I made, uh, during my PhD, I made mutants, and then uh, I had an hypothesis that one particular, so I'm not going into details, but one particular uh, approach could rescue the defects of this fish. I, this was an hypothesis I didn't really believe in so much, so I postponed the experiment for so long because I said, okay, that's never going to work. And at the end, at some point, I decided to give it a try. And that Monday, I look at the microscope uh, and I saw that it worked. And uh, (laughs) it was a difficult year, I have to say, because many things didn't work for a while. And and you said uh, October, that's pretty much towards the end of the year. Well, uh, it's okay. <laughs> that made my PhD. I Honestly, after that, 
you you need one you need one day like this to forget 300 before uh, that were negative yeah. <laughs> uh, and i don't really feel the i don't even remember how bad uh, i felt in the 10 months before that was not so bad of course but it was tough and then that day made me forget everything because you realize that at the end even with like many failures on the way you arrive where you wanted and that was like the closure. Then, of course, I had to do many more experiments and so on, but that was the thing that really twisted the story. It was basically what, it's like a readout for you. Yeah. It's to say nice. this is... And of... having an hypothesis and seeing it proven, that's the, it doesn't matter where you're going to publish afterwards, uh, if it's the lowest journal, the highest journal, sometimes it doesn't even depend yeah. on how good of a science you're doing. <laughs> but... At the end, you just need that. You just need to, to see that science works. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, at least the concept of doing systematic like, yeah. research works. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, what about you? I, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, uh, I actually cite her word of like having a day with an experiment working can make you forget 300 days of experiments not working or hypothesis working. So, yeah, I think this, these were one of the happiest moments in the PhD. Um, I can also add um, um, coming up with a new hypothesis or a new idea. So uh, for me, when when things get stuck or at some moments where things got stuck and you don't have like any other, like, and it seems that your hypothesis is completely wrong and then you just sit down and start reading and, and develop a new idea uh, or a new like way of approaching uh, this question. I think this was also for me very enjoyable because... I don't know, it brought, uh, like, I mean, it made me feel uh, that I can now think, you know, uh, like as a, because when I was a kid, I was always like, how do, you, do these people come up with all of these great ideas and so on? <laughs> I so, always thought that uh, during my master, I thought, but I would never be able to do that. So exactly. I can maybe do my experiment, but how can you generate new hypotheses? Exactly. You know, like, uh, I think, I think this comes by time because, yeah, when you're a master's student or a bachelor's student, even a first year PhD student, when you're mainly supervised by your, uh, by a postdoc or by uh, the PI himself or herself, um, um, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's very like, and you think, can I be a PI one day or can I be a group leader? I, can, I mean, how can they come up with ideas, you know, but yeah. then by time you see that you can do it. And I think these are happy moments as well. And, um, one last thing I can add, um, uh, I think the joy of having the first citation or having your paper, <laughs> once you publish it being cited is also very enjoyable because you see that people started benefiting from the science you did. Or so. people agree with the work you did. Exactly. And their so, work sort of has your work as a basis. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, these are the happiest moments. Well, that's, that's actually something great to hear. And so it's like when you actually start doing your work life or when you start living a life in research, do you feel this sort of incumbent pressure to sort of s spread your work around so that everyone can see it? Or do you feel if my work is sort of, you know, and like sort of it's, a, it's curled up in a ball somewhere, doesn't really have, you know, it, it's okay. I did my due, due diligence. I did all this work, but I don't care if it doesn't, if the world doesn't get to know about it. Or mm -hmm. do you have this feeling that the world has to know what I've done? So is that, so that I'm just putting up a very tough question up here, but let's, I yes. want to hear your take on this. I think you're talking with two people who like to, to spread. <laughs> <laughs> so we might be biased towards that. We are both, uh, I don't know, Mohammed will say what he thinks afterwards, but if I know him enough, <laughs> he'll probably agree. I think that uh, being able to communicate what you've done, it's one of the best things in science being able to share, going to conferences and uh, having a talk was one of the best experiences in, uh, in the whole PhD. Like having the possibility of uh, staying there and like having 50, 100, it doesn't matter, uh, people listening to you and asking questions and being interested in your work. It's something that, yeah, it's uh, unique, I would say. And in general, but not just about your project. 
Uh, in particular, I love talking about science and sharing science. And uh, yeah, maybe later we can go into that about scientific communication more in particular. But I think that being able to like make people excited about uh, what you're doing or science in general is one of the best feelings. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, um, yeah, I'm also a kind of person who likes to spread. And uh, to answer your exact question, I think... I think Hopefully I would... not viruses, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true. Uh, no, but I think, I mean, also going back to what Julia initially said about um, uh, real scientists not... Uh, like Or pseudoscience being spread because real scientists do not really do the communication as well uh, as them. Um, so um, I think it's also very important. Uh, yeah, besides, it's very enjoyable. It's also uh, very important to uh, uh, spread the science. And, um, and I feel that um, um, science should be available for everyone and knowledge should be available for everyone. I think this can bring us to another topic of like openness and so on. But um, 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 for me, uh, when I had my papers published, for example, uh, I, I really did all, all I can to like make it uh, like viewable for everyone, you know, or like uh, advertise it as much as I can. Um, not only for for the sake of like having my research known and citable and so on, which counts in the end for for like a, sci- a scientist's success at the, uh, according to the current metrics, um, but also um, just for the sake of knowledge. And uh, on the other hand, also sort of a, it can be sort of a nice motive or a positive motive for uh, people who are willing to pursue a career in science or people who are uh, in the future going to be uh, like, or people who are currently uh, finalizing a manuscript, for example, or getting it published, you know, so all of these things, I think, uh, were drivers to try and uh, better make your research visible there. I think we'll end the first episode of the podcast here. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Kai. Thank you for Thank having you us and see you next time. Looking forward for the next time. Stay tuned and we'll have them back on for the next episode where we discuss more details. Mm-hmm.